The history of British architecture up to the beginning of the 20th century has been one of evolution. A story that's unfolded over the best part of a thousand years. But the horrors of the First World War stimulated a revolution in architecture. This new movement turned its back on history and tradition and looked to the new. It was, in turn, to fascinate, confuse and derail British architecture. That movement was modernism. Like the arrival of Norman architecture, a new style had arrived from the continent, making a clean break with what had come before. And like we'd done hundreds of years before, we absorbed this new style and made it our own. And as with the Normans, we went on to produce buildings that were often brilliant, but were, in their time, sometimes alienating and brutal. This is the story of the architecture of 20th century Britain. My view of British architectural history is one of evolution rather than revolution. But in the years immediately after the First World War, there were a close-knit group of thinkers, writers, designers and architects in Europe who turned their back on history and tradition. Why? Because they thought that those were the things that had caused the war in the first place. <laughs> After centuries of architectural evolution, revolution became the buzzword. Modernism had arrived. This is what the modernists rejected. Buildings from the early years of the 20th century that grew out of tradition and enjoyed decoration. This was the opposite of what modernism was about. They justified their point of view with new and radical theories. Architecture had become intellectualized. Simplicity and functionality were the future. History was quite literally a thing of the past. The arrival of modernism in Britain after the war was equivalent to the arrival of the Norman style after the conquest in 1066. It was an entirely new style. It turned its back on the past. It was rich with political purpose and it changed the way Britain looked. Hungarian architect Erno Goldfinger built this short terrace of houses in Willow Road, Hampstead, in 1939. It caused a storm of controversy amongst the locals. Erno and his wife Ursula lived in the middle one. Here we can see how new ideas about how to build and how to live were put into practice by an idealistic and forceful character. A personal quirk that he had, which was rather special to him, was to use found objects, really, um, for his furniture. So uh, here, for example, on the sideboard, we've got these I-beams um, sawn off, um, standard bits of sort of building site stuff. It looks very really industrial, seen. yes. Exactly, but clever. I mean, it actually does its job very nicely. Under the table, it's held up on a machine tool base, a, a fantastic big piece of cast iron that you know, we'll make sure the table doesn't fall over, but it's also a cheap thing to buy. You don't have to remake that. The decoration, as it were, comes out of the way that you live. It's also very light, isn't it? Because this is almost, almost a wall of continuous glass. It is, and this is really architecturally one of the things that sets it apart from, from an earlier house or a more conventional house of the same date. And you can open this door, you come straight into the living room. This room's... A lot warmer, isn't it? Because it's completely lined in wood. But it isn't sort of my idea of comfort because these chairs look very uncomfortable. 
And there are so many hard surfaces, so many sharp edges and so many clean lines and so much lack of decoration. It was a didactic house. There are letters that Erno wrote to Ursula before they were married in which he's describing the house that he will build and that it will teach her how to be less bourgeois and I suppose by implication teach the world uh, how to live in a better new way. Isn't that one of the things that, that does put people off this type of architecture, this period of architecture, is it does, it does have this mission to tell you how to live and how to live in a new and modern way which they assume is better than the old way. It has aspects of religious conversion about it. You, you become a believer. The modernists saw architecture as a way of bringing their utopian vision of society to the masses. The message was, if you lived in a house like this, your life would be better. While Goldfinger built a house to teach his wife about the benefits of modernism, his contemporary, Bertolt Lubetkin, went even further, building a zoo that wouldn't only entertain, but enlighten the people of Britain. Anna Kay is on a mission to discover how a simple zoo brought the brave new world of modernism to the British public. So what was Lebetkin trying to achieve here at Dudley? He was, in fact, an emigre from Soviet Russia. And in his view, architecture was about a lot more than just the building. In fact, he believed that architecture could change the world. Lebetkin Zoo, which opened in 1937, consisted of 13 buildings. It was a showcase for the best of modernist architecture. For the people of the depressed West Midlands, it was a glimpse of a brighter future. You just have to look around you and you can see that Dudley, like the rest of the West Midlands, is almost a continuous urban sprawl. And at the time that Lebetkin originally came here, in the late 30s, there wasn't a lot in the way of amusements and amenities. And I think he really saw the opportunity with the zoo to provide the local people with entertainment, but also present modernist architecture that, to them in a way that they'd never seen before. He'd been born in the Russian Empire, he'd witnessed the Russian Revolution from his bedroom mm. window, and he'd been wrapped up in the whole sort of constructivist movement in those early post-revolutionary years. And then to think of him bringing all those influences to Dudley and building what is almost a sort of giant piece of constructivist art in the middle of this area is quite amazing. Lebetkin believed that the sight of perfect modernist buildings set in a beautiful landscape would convert the population. His dreams became reality. The people came in their droves. Dudley Zoo was a runaway success. On its opening day, 250,000 people turned up here, of whom only 50,000 could actually get in. Over the following summer season, 700,000 people visited the zoo. To put that in perspective, that's about as many visitors as Stonehenge gets today. Dudley Zoo was a sensation. The Beckham Zoo was an announcement. For the people of Dudley in the 1930s, used to the overcrowded and sometimes unsanitary conditions in the town, it sounded a drum for a new, bright, sleek, clean, and above all, modern way of living. It was, if you like, the blueprint for a new world. But this was only the beginning. The modernists were very soon to have the opportunity to experiment on a massive scale. The Second World War destroyed the centres of many British towns and cities, and they would, of course, need rebuilding. But the question was, would the utopian experiment succeed? Between 1939 and 1945, 74,000 tonnes of high explosive rained down on Britain. Hitler's aim was twofold, to cripple industrial towns, but also to demoralise the population by destroying historic buildings and landmarks. The city of Coventry was a major target, and by the end of the war, over 1,500 people had been killed. In the aftermath, the survivors needed reassurance that life would return to normal. Central to the effort to reclaim a sense of normality was the reconstruction of the cathedral. And in my opinion, 
it was here that one of the great successes of post-war rebuilding took place. The city was faced with a dilemma. Should they repair this beautiful medieval structure, or should they build a new one in an entirely modern style? Designed by the Scottish architect Sir Basil Spence and opened in 1962, it is one of the greatest modern buildings, evolved from a thousand-year tradition of cathedral building. Great space, isn't that? The way it just opens forward and you can see everything from baptism behind us through to crucifixion and death in this simple, that very carefully engineered space. The whole of this ceiling, to me, it looks like a, it was almost like a cobweb. Well, it's based on the eyes of a fly, blown up using latest modern microscopes in the 50s. Yet it's also essentially quintessential Gothic fan vault. It's got that feeling that you could be in a medieval cathedral almost. Well, this is what this church is all about. It's about compromise, it's about bringing tradition and modernity together. And you see that in the simplicity of the art as well as in the structure. I love the baptistry, I love this stained glass, and I love the... Is, is it, it's the sun, isn't it, this great it is. thing it's, here? It is. It's the east sun rising over the very simple hewn font that's just a stone from Bethlehem. It's almost like a medieval building for, built for illiterate people. It's very much a people's cathedral, People paying for this building out of their own pockets. Spence did fantastic amount of lecturing to raise money from ordinary people for this building when the church and the city council weren't very forthcoming. And he made himself very much a public figure, and this was a public building. And I remember being brought here my, by my parents as a small child, and it was so packed. You had to sort of shuffle round up one aisle and down the next. All I could remember are these pennies on the floor, which I think are just gorgeous mementos for any child. 1962 is the year the cathedral was opened, and it has a special resonance for me because it also happens to be the year I was born. <laughs> You're giving yourself away, aren't you? Now, this is um, something else that I think is really wonderful about this building, which is the way the roof is held up by these incredibly slender, very, very elegant columns. Beautifully made concrete. This is concrete as it should be done. Beautifully made. It's almost like stone. And yet, look below your feet. What's holding this whole building up are just tiny, slender pieces of steel. My favourite thing in this whole cathedral is the eagle on top of the pulpit. I mean, it's by Elizabeth Frink, isn't it? It is. And I just love the way it's a reference back to a great medieval brass lectern, one of those things built in the 13th or 14th century. But it's so modern, it's so beautiful, it's there poised up to fly into the congregation with the word of God. It's art gallery quality art brought into a cathedral or public space, which is very much the thinking of the time in the 1950s. But what's great about this cathedral is the quality of the art, all by internationally known names. And the design of the cathedral became based around the art because it was commissioned first. Although superficially there isn't much connection stylistically between the burnt-out ruin of the old cathedral and Basil Spence's gleaming new cathedral, I think in reality there is, because what Spence created was recognisably in the tradition of the great medieval cathedral builders. One of the factors behind Coventry's success was that the architect talked to the people who'd use it. In fact, a large proportion of the funding was provided by the people of Coventry. But in post-war Britain, that was the exception rather than the rule. <laughs> 
I think the most important characteristic of architecture after the war was the fact that it was the architecture of the state. Everything was being nationalised. There were huge areas of our towns and cities that had been destroyed by bombs, and it was necessary for the state to act. And this meant that architectural patronage was concentrated in the hands of the local authorities and of central government. There were virtually no private patrons at all. And this fundamentally influenced the shape of what was actually built. The post-war period was an era of optimism, ambition and innovation in the way architects thought about buildings. And it was in Britain that a totally new, austere, almost fundamentalist vision of modernism was born. This movement, called the New Brutalism, was born out of the work of the fiercely intellectual architect couple Peter and Alison Smithson. The Smithsons burst onto the scene in the 50s as the iconic, angry young architects. They set out to provoke, outrage and cross swords with the architectural community. Their first commission was the Hunstanton School in North Norfolk. It was a shot across the bows of an architectural community that they viewed as staid and conservative. It was, in fact, the architecture of rebellion. Here, the Smithsons set out to build a new type of school. They wanted to get away from contemporary school styles that they regarded as being slightly twee. But this building is much more important than that because they were also setting out to build a new type of architecture, a style that we call brutalism, and this is the first brutalist building. It was a style that was very intellectual, it was very theoretical. In fact, so theoretical that the Smithsons didn't even visit this site before they designed this building. The question's really got to be asked is, is a school really the right place to conduct a great experiment in a new type of architecture? This secondary school, effectively a glass and steel box, was designed for 450 pupils in 1954. It was quite unlike anything that had ever been built in Britain before, uncompromisingly innovative. The classrooms are arranged in pairs and each pair is accessed by a staircase. This is very deliberate as far as the Smithsons were concerned. They wanted to avoid wasting any space and they were very keen not to have any corridors. The other advantage it has is that when the pupils have finished their lessons, they can come down into communal space. And eventually they enter this monumental assembly hall right at the centre of the school. The roof is organised to bring light in through clerestory windows. And everywhere you look, everything is very carefully and simply designed. In the late 50s, this was Boys' Lavatory number five, and it's a good place to come to see how the extreme leanness of the design here works. Of course, this building was built in a period of post-war austerity. Building materials were still rationed. And so when you look at a, a lavatory cubicle like this, it's actually made of pieces of piping just screwed together and fixed into the floor. Very simple, very cheap. Same really goes for the basins. Now, these basins have been replaced, but they're all bolted onto an L-shaped girder. And when it comes to getting rid of the waste, it's not in a continuous copper pipe, because copper's an expensive material. It actually disgorges into a ceramic trough. <laughs> I think they want to prove that there's something in architecture other than prettiness. They want to really examine the modernist concept of honesty to materials. Modernists had said we must expose what we're doing, we must show the structure, uh, and they really did it. They showed all the steel, they showed all the brick. Everything is what it looks like. There was a huge backlash against it from the older generation whom it was intended to offend. So you have people writing to architectural journals about new barbarism and you have a very strong reaction against it saying you can't put children in a building like that, that uh, it's crass, that it's crude. As a design for a school, it's deeply flawed. In the heat of the summer, the welded steel frame distorts, causing the windows to crack and explode. 
not what I would call a success. Because they'd never even been to the site, they don't realise that Hunstanton is one of the sunniest bits of Britain. <laughs> this is the best beach in the whole of uh, North Norfolk, just, yes. uh, just uh, ten yards from here. I mean, you die with heat in this building. <laughs> well, I think part of what's going on there is that there had been such improvements in services in the previous 20 years. The central heating was very new and had suddenly become ubiquitous, and every council flat was being built with it. And I think they probably believed that the same would be possible with cooling, and that... Uh, problems would be solved by technology. It's a very strong belief of the time, of the 50s and 60s. They really did think that uh, they, could, they could build in the hope of a better world growing around their buildings. This problematic building isn't the only villain of the piece. The problems arose as it influenced the design decisions of local authority architects throughout the 60s and 70s. Architects who wanted to design modernist schools and strove to imitate the Smithsons. It's very difficult for us today to appreciate just what a big influence this building built in a small town in Norfolk actually had. The Smithsons set out to change the way the architectural profession in Britain thought and the way they designed buildings, and they actually succeeded in making international waves, which is a pretty rare thing in British architectural history. But I think the core question about this school is, was it, in fact, in the end, a force for good in British architecture? I don't think it was. Why? Because it launched the new brutalism, a style that would unfortunately become the architecture of choice for the newly formed welfare state of the 1950s. Britain needed to house its expanding population. And so the councils turned to brutalist architects who promised to build fast and cheap. But the honesty in the brutalist treatment of materials created buildings that, in my opinion, are simply ugly set against our historic traditions of building in timber, brick and stone. Being built cheap, they also suffered from sometimes disastrous structural problems. But worst of all, the building of the new estates corresponded with the rise of vandalism and crime in the 1970s. The walkways and stairwells of these estates became frightening places to live. And it was into this rapidly worsening scenario that the Smithsons stepped with one of their later commissions. In many ways, the Smithsons were the great British gurus of modernism. They wrote extensively and their writings were perceived on the continent as being the great intellectual justification for British modernism. But in Britain, they built very little. So the question is, what happened when they got a really important public commission? Robin Hood Gardens in East London was built in 1972. It encapsulates everything that I think is bad about cheaply built concrete estates. It consists of two blocks containing 214 flats, providing high-density housing for over a 1,000 people. Here, the Smithsons realised their concept of so-called streets in the sky. This was their attempt to transfer the communal spirit they noticed in terraced streets into high-rise blocks. But it didn't work. By the time this block was built, the people of Britain simply didn't want to live in buildings like this. The modernists wanted a new world. But people wanted buildings that felt familiar, not alienating. It would be very unfair to try and judge the whole modernist movement on the basis of this scheme, which was very badly flawed for various reasons. But it has to be said that it spawned a whole series of developments that went on to rape our towns and cities. These buildings were made of grey, unyielding concrete in towns that were generally full of mellow brick and stone. They were tall with block-like structures in townscapes that were low and picturesque, and they came together 
with road schemes that tore up the historic street pattern. And for that reason, it's possible to appreciate the historic significance of this building, but it's very difficult to forgive it. While the modernist agenda was radically changing the architecture of public buildings such as schools and mass housing, there were projects afoot which would transform whole cities along modernist lines. The modernists were visionaries and their ambitions stretched far further than just building houses and zoos. What happened when they had the opportunity to rebuild an entire city? Stephen Parisian investigates what became of the utopian rebuilding of his hometown of Plymouth, the most bombed city of the Second World War. Most people think that Britain's cities were modernised as a result of German bombing during World War II, but that's not entirely the case. In many places, city planners were dreaming of a modernist utopia before the war. To unand the story behind the rebuilding of my hometown, I dropped in on Jeremy Gould, Professor of Architecture at the University of Plymouth. In the 1930s, Victorian architecture was, was very much perceived, wasn't it, as part of the, the dirty old past. I think there's a marvellous yeah. overview, isn't there, here, of, of showing the cramped streets which yeah. they saw yeah. as insanitary, keeping out light. Of course, some of those problems were real. I mean, tuberculosis in cities was a problem. Mm. Water supply and typhoid was a genuine mm. problem. In the 1930s, of course, modernism was very much linked with health, with, with the beneficial effects of exercise, of sunlight, and crowded old Victorian cities presumably were about the, you know, the last place to, to pursue that, such ideals. Yes, Victorian architecture was dirty and old-fashioned, and that generation hated the architecture of the previous generation. So with the destruction of the Second World War, they had the chance to sweep the old city away. Post-war Plymouth was to be a triumphant vision of a modernist utopia. But did the grand designs of the city architects work? Per square yard, Jeremy, we know that Plymouth was the most bombed city in Britain, but not everything went, did it? I mean, in this post-war photo, you can still see a lot of the Victorian townscape still there. But, I mean, it started during the war that the Royal Engineers dynamited any damaged building. But the point was, of course, they were clearing the city, waiting for this new vision which Sir Patrick Abercrombie provided in 1943 with a plan for Plymouth. A grand plan like this wasn't without precedent. Over 200 years earlier, Edinburgh Newtown was built from scratch. But while that was realised through the efforts of private entrepreneurs, this was a state-sponsored new city. Jeremy, it, it's very obvious from up here, isn't it, how the grid works and uh, where it stops. You can see the old Victorian city stretching way over there. And this central axis below us here, that's the centre point, is it? It's the basis of the grand idea. It was all rigidly zoned. This is the shopping zone, this is the civic zone, the churches are all together at the south end, and out on the west was the theatre precinct. We're very much here, aren't we, looking down at the quality end of the development with the, the splendid bank terminating the view up the... Royal Parade. This bit is the most complete part. As, the, as time wore on and as the city was developed northwards, the money ran out, the scale was reduced, the quality of the architecture went down because they literally couldn't afford to build buildings of this scale. One of the buildings that wasn't affected by later cost cuts was this, the ultra-modern replacement for Plymouth's lost Victorian pannier market. Jeremy, Brave New Plymouth still incorporated key elements of the Victorian city, didn't it? Yes, it did. The pannier market was a great tradition in the pre-war city, and this was the new version replacing the bombed old one. And, of course, it's made of new materials, off-shutter concrete. It's, it's far from mean, isn't it? It's a very dramatic interior, very light, very high. Yes, it's terrific. It's a sort of cathedral, if you like, to, to commerce, and it's made of thin, thin vaulted concrete, a revolutionary structure for its time. So, really, encouragingly, a new form has been found for a very traditional function. Yes, that's exactly right, and the tradition continues. But on the fringes of the city, the money ran out, and uninspiring rows of shop fronts were erected. And it is in these areas by the ring road that you find the worst of 60s and 70s council architecture and a site depressingly familiar to us all, the multi-storied car park. <laughs> 
What Abercrombie and his fellow planners could not have anticipated was that in the decades after the Second World War, use of the car increased hugely. The response by the 1960s and 70s was, to say the least, disappointing. Huge structures like the one behind me were inserted crudely, brusquely, into the dense city centre plan. More recently, Plymouth City Council have attempted to lighten the structure by making it into a sort of hanging gardens of Plymouth, but the, the result is still the same, something brutal, ugly, that really doesn't fit with Abercrombie's vision one iota. Although I'm being quite rude about much of the architecture that was put up immediately after the Second World War, it was actually very exciting. It was an extremely exciting period. Building materials were very scarce, and this meant that engineers had to push their art to its very limits, and it meant that some buildings were created that were really structurally quite extraordinary. In fact, some of the best post-war buildings were constructed out of concrete. Ed McCann visits Stockwell Garage to find out how the ingenious use of concrete overcame the post-war shortage of steel and produced one of the great buildings of Britain. In the years after the Second World War, London was a place of rebuilding and regeneration. Lots of things were going to change. It was a brave new world. And one of the things that was going to change was the way that people moved around. Before the war, the main means of public transport in town was the tram. And trams are viewed as rickety and uncomfortable and inflexible because they had to stay on the rails. And the answer to this problem was going to be the bus. It's hard for us to imagine now, but the bus was going to be the great bit of technology. They were fast, they were flexible, they didn't have tracks, and people liked them a lot. And in the same way that the trains of the 19th century had to have their cathedral terminuses, so did the buses. And this is one of them. This is a classic piece of Form Follows function design. This building is not about adornment or beauty in the first instance. This is about buses. When you've got 200 buses milling around in this space, you don't want them banging into any columns. So this is a column-free space. And in fact, when it was built, this was the biggest concrete roof without any columns inside in the whole of Europe. This building is a really high quality piece. I mean, it's over 50 years old, but it feels like you're in a building that's five or 10 years old. If you look around you, there's little evidence of stuff falling apart. And as you look closer, you realize, ah, they did this very, very carefully. I mean, the, the surfaces are all extremely hard wearing. It's a, a low maintenance piece. It's been adapted and, and is adaptable. So it's been very well considered. Post-war Britain was struggling to offset the war debt through exporting all of its steel. So concrete was the material of choice for big buildings like this. But where did the designers get the inspiration for the roof? Comparison with a cathedral is hard to avoid here. I mean, we see a lot of elements that we see when we look at cathedrals. We've got arches and vaults laid on top of other arches and vaults. Rather like in the sort of Gothic and Romanesque cathedrals, the way that the arches hit the ground allows us to have these huge windows letting light into the spaces. And the way it works is we have these great big 180 foot span arches going from side to side with a series of smaller barrel vaults between them working along the building. And at the end of these big, big arches, we have huge vertical loads. I mean, there's 400 tonnes coming down on each of these. Now, 400 tonnes is about 60 double-decker buses. And if you stack them all up, it'd be about as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Now, if this was a Gothic cathedral, I'd expect to see a great big buttress here resolving the horizontal thrusts that come out of the arch. But there's none at all. And the reason for that is that on this building, the horizontal forces are brought down through these massive piers to a steel bar encased in concrete that sits under the ground there and runs right along, right to the other side of the building and stops the arch ends from popping out. These sorts of industrial buildings are my favourites. I really like their simplicity, their honesty and their basic functionality. 
I don't think they set out to make a, a pretty building. They didn't intend to at all. And yet, by paying careful attention to the structural function of the building, the span they had to cover, they've come up with what I think is a really beautiful roof structure. Some of the greatest modern buildings arrived in the early 60s in the universities of Britain. Finished in 1966, Arne Jacobsen's St Catherine's College, Oxford, was a triumph of modernism respecting tradition. His design was based on modernist principles, but the shape was based on the layout of medieval colleges. Jacobsen's genius was to design the college from the essential bell tower, through the buildings, right down to the cutlery in the refectory. But my favourite of the new universities has to be the University of East Anglia in Norwich, from 1968, designed by Dennis Lasden. Yeah, I just love these cigarettes. I think they are fantastic. They're sculptural. They're one of the few pieces of modern architecture that I think just sort of just works like that. One thing that's very distinctive about Lasden's architecture is that instead of just designing a, an abstract solution to a problem, uh, and then putting it down where there's a site available. He designs very specifically for a site. So in this site, there's a valley which slightly slopes in towards the middle, and he's designed the ziggurats to hug the side of the valley so that they get the beautiful views down to the broad as they've now made it. So it's a very specific response to where there's the beautiful woodland and the water and where there is um, a hillside which he builds onto. It couldn't be more unlike what the Smithsons are doing at Hans Stanton School. They could have put it on Mars, it could have been in Spain, it doesn't really matter where it was. Absolutely. But this was built for here, which is why it's almost a piece of landscape. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's at one with the landscape and it em emphasises the qualities of the landscape. Buildings aren't just fantastic things to look at. Lasden discussed the project thoroughly with his client, the Chancellor of the University. As a result, it's brilliantly designed as well. You get to the student rooms along these high walks and every now and again the building is broken and your vision is funneled in and then outwards towards the landscape. It's incredibly theatrical. But instead of building all the rooms off long, alien corridors, he used a trick from the medieval colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, he the rooms off staircases. The priority was to fit the maximum number of rooms in, and so they're not particularly generous in size, but they have this very nice period fitted furniture, it's a little drawer under the bed. But the really tremendous thing is the view from the window. As you come into this relatively small room, your whole horizon, your whole perspective explodes outwards. It's a very, very democratic way of designing student accommodation. The undergraduates have the best view. This sort of concrete steel and glass modernism is very, very easy to do badly and it's very difficult to do well. In my view, the key to its success is when it relates properly to its context. And what UEA shows is that in the hands of a really great architect like Lasden, the modernism of the 1970s can be really, really successful. Dennis Lasden also designed the Royal National Theatre, built in the mid-70s. It was a showpiece for brutalism. But the National, although a brilliant building in itself, sticks out a mile on the south bank. It's like a spaceship has landed by the Thames. The University of East Anglia, though, fits into the landscape. It's sensitive to its surroundings. <laughs> 
One of the reasons that Dennis Lasden's buildings at the University of East Anglia are so successful is because they respond incredibly effectively to their context. And here I think we come to the nub of the issue. For too many towns and cities in the post-war period, these state-sponsored buildings were completely divorced from the historic cities that they were placed in. So how do we manage to construct modern buildings in our historic city centres and what kind of architecture will work for the 21st century? The real battleground over what is good and bad in post-war British architecture was the mass housing project. And one of the most controversial of these was the Barbican. Built by the Corporation of London during the 1960s and 70s, people have slowly learned to love it. With 2,014 flats across 40 acres, it's one of the largest estates in the capital. But when it was opened, the public were apprehensive about its uncompromising brutalism. Look at its ambition, look at the scale, look at all the architectural references which, of course, are European and French. And, and I think that for 25 years there's been an interesting dialogue where people have been saying, why does this building, why does this estate cause us anxiety? And I think it is because in a very important and deliberate way, it's not British. Even though the Barbican's brutal, in-your-face architecture to many people seems foreign, it does have a strange appeal. Although there's no doubt that this building turns its back on the past in so many ways, it's not without a sense of place in the wider history of London. It's, in fact, built on the site of the Roman fortress. And I don't think it's too fanciful to imagine that this water is a moat and this great walkway that I'm on is a drawbridge. It is, after all, called the Barbican. In my opinion, the Barbican Centre is a great work of architecture, but it has great flaws too, principally in the way it turns its back on the rest of the city of London. But as a modernist building, it succeeds, and succeeds very well, but only for two reasons. The first is its location. It's sited in the heart of the financial capital of the nation, and everybody wants to live here. But secondly, because of money. The corporation has invested huge sums of money on maintaining and managing it. And without that, great residential modernist complexes like this simply don't succeed. But across the Thames, in the shadow of the brutalist National Theatre, is a development that I believe shows us the way forward. Despite the undeniable problems with much post-war British architecture, there are now some really tremendous buildings being created in this country. And many of them have very deliberately learnt from the mistakes of the past. And one of my favourites is here at the ongoing development at Coin Street in Waterloo. This area was originally set for office development in the early 80s, but the local community protested and bought the site themselves. And what did they decide to build? An updated version of the Georgian Square, made up of 59 houses and maisonettes. No pokey flats. Despite being entirely modern, it is rooted in tradition. It is evolutionary, not revolutionary. The first reading of this is as a, as a Georgian Square, as, an, as a complete urban block with a hole in the middle, where a series of individual houses come together in, a, in an occupied communal space. And this scheme here I mean, is very novel, it's very original, but it just doesn't turn its back on everything that had come before. 
one of the most radical things we think we've achieved on this scheme is, is not to be radical at all, but just build on, on some of the models that already exist. We're dealing with a very different set of circumstances here, but that doesn't mean to say that you have to throw away the good elements of historic architecture, such as the size and the shape and the, the, the overall form of, of, of the dwellings. I've recently been to see the Smithson School in Hunstanton, and there's the exa example of a building that was generated by ideas and was sort of put down in a field in the middle of Norfolk, and the children were told to sort of get on and, you know, be educated in it. But your approach really is more or less the opposite of that. This isn't housing for the rich. This is for inner-city workers. But they haven't been shortchanged. From the solar panels that heat the water to the neatly designed rubbish holders, this is top-quality architecture, not the cheaply built, over-intellectualised buildings like the Robin Hood estate. When post-war housing projects gave us a chance to build, we too often built ugly, alienating and cheap high-density tower blocks. Coin Street shows us that mass housing can work, that it can be a place people want to live in. It isn't pastiche, it draws on fundamentals derived from a thousand years of architectural evolution. It's clear to me that modernism interrupted the great sweep of British architectural history disconnecting architecture from those great buildings that had shaped Britain. But coming here to Coin Street, I feel a lot more optimistic. Here we have architects who are reconnecting with their past, producing buildings which I think will make Britain a better place to live in. And that is the story of British architecture. It's a story that springs from our dislike of revolution and our preference for evolution. It springs from our individualism. When we take new styles, we make them our own. We decorate, we embellish. It springs from the genius and the vision of individual architects and entrepreneurs, and not from the power and authority of the state. It springs from the fact that we live on an island, often isolated from the trends of design on the continent. We make it up as we go along. And it springs from our innate inventiveness, our desire to experiment and innovate. This is how Britain's buildings were shaped. And those buildings now shape us. <laughs>